This is for the Ethics Review class at Parker University. We've been talking about business entities for operating a chiropractic practice. And what I want to talk about in this video is situations with multiple owners. If, if there's only one owner of the business, whether it's a sole proprietorship or a limited liability company or a corporation, it can be set up pretty simply and, it, and the owner has a great deal of discretion in how they run the business. But if the business is going to be operated with multiple owners, it is important for those owners to reach certain agreements and it's important to reduce those agreements to writing so that if disputes arise in the future or if somebody wants to leave the practice for some reason, uh, there's a fairly clear uh, agreement in place that governs how decisions are made and how somebody can leave or dissolve the practice. So start with the first one, which is simply the purpose of the business. If you just use some form that was downloaded off the internet, the forms typically say something to the effect of the business is going to do everything legally allowed to earn a profit. But it may be that the purpose of the business is more specific. If the purpose of the business is to operate a chiropractic practice, then that should be the purpose of the business. And the reason for that is to avoid conflicts of interest so that if the business owners have other activities where they try to make money doing other things, it doesn't create a problem or a conflict with the uh, purpose of the business that's being run by the multiple owners. So define what the purpose of the business is. Uh, certainly it's okay to use that broad definition, but it can cause problems down the road. <clears throat> Agree on the name of the business. Now this one seems pretty obvious, but it's absolutely remarkable how many times I've seen multiple owners of a business have difficulty deciding what the correct name of the business is. Is there a comma before the LLC or not? What abbreviations are included or not included in the name? And so forth. Reach an agreement. What are we going to call the business? If it's going to be called Smith and Jones, decide whether Smith comes first or whether it should be called Jones and Smith. Uh, make those decisions before you start the business. Duration of the business. How long will the business last? Typical business just lasts in perpetuity. It lasts until it's dissolved. Um, sometimes when an investor is putting money into a business, they may want to set a deadline so that they know when they can get their money out of the business. So particularly in real estate transactions, uh, 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 or excuse me, a business entity that owns real estate, there may be a deadline, a time that the business ends. And what that does is it requires that the business be liquidated at that time so that the owners can get their money out of the business. Uh, depending upon the reason you're creating the business entity, uh, you may want to specify a limited duration and expiration date for the business, or you may want to just use the general clause that it lasts in perpetuity. What property will belong to the business entity? If the owners are contributing property as their initial investment into the business, instead of writing a check for $1,000, they're contributing some used adjusting tables, then it needs to be clear that that property is being transferred to the name of the business entity and held in the name of the business entity. Uh, covenant not to compete. Of course, when multiple owners are in a business together, they owe a duty to each other not to compete with that business. But when the business ends or when one of the owners leaves the business, they then are free to compete with it. And it may be that the business wants to create a covenant not to compete so that the business can be protected and the owners who stay with the business can be protected. And as I discussed under employment agreements, the covenant not to compete may prohibit solicitation of patients, may protect or prevent the uh, person leaving from hiring employees away from the business. It may also prevent the person leaving from uh, uh, practicing chiropractic within a certain territory for a certain period of time. Uh, owners need to agree on management of business. Uh, one thing I recommend strongly is that there are certain matters or certain decisions that are so important that they should only be made 
with unanimous consent of the owners. If the owners can't agree unanimously, then the business should not be able to make those decisions. So for example, a decision to dissolve or to liquidate the business or to sell substantially all of its assets is something that should require everybody's consent before it happens. You may also want to expand that. Uh, depending on the nature of the business and the number of owners involved, I think sometimes it makes sense to require unanimous consent for certain types of contracts or contracts over a certain dollar value so that everybody who is, is risking their investment is in agreement that that's an appropriate decision uh, uh, to enter that contract. I also think it's a good idea to require unanimous consent to either hire or fire employees. Um, it helps prevent people from making rash decisions. It helps prevent the owners from making decisions out of anger. And it forces them to be a little more retrospective and be ready to defend their decision rather than just immediately saying somebody's fired. So those contracts and hiring and firing of personnel uh, are two types of decisions that might be might require unanimous consent. Uh, the owners also need to decide how they're going to divide the profits. Now, usually people who are going into business together, are, they're often friends, they like each other, they trust each other. So they want to start out by saying, well, let's not just, just divide the profits equally. And that may work out well when the business starts. Uh, the problem is after the business has been in operation for two or three or five years, it becomes pretty apparent that some of the owners are making more of a contribution to the profits than other owners. Some of the owners may be working harder than some of the other owners. And that if the profits are still being divided equally, that creates some friction, some an antagonism between the owners. And the easy way to avoid that is to discuss when you start the business, how are we going to divide the profits and to develop a system or a formula. Uh, so for example, in a chiropractic practice, uh, part of the value is producing the work that generates the income and part of the value is bringing the patients into the clinic. Uh, so perhaps you develop some kind of system that rewards a portion of the income based on who's bringing patients into the clinic. Or, or how many patients are being brought into the clinic and allocate a portion of the income based on who's doing the work and producing the income. Um, and that helps to avoid uh, uh, problems down the road. It helps the partners or the co-owners to understand uh, what's valuable or not valuable. Now, if the co-owners are unable to reach an agreement on how to divide the profits while they still like and trust each other, I can almost guarantee you that once they start becoming or feeling antagonistic towards each other, there's no chance they will reach an agreement on dividing the profits. And then when the business gets liquidated, just like the profits, it's going to get divided equally and the uh, antagonism just gets worse. Uh, buyout agreement. There needs to be some provision. One of the things that needs to be considered in these agreements is how do we bring about the end of the business? What if we don't want to work together anymore? How do we, how do we handle that? Uh, one easy way to handle that is a buy-sell or a buy-out agreement. Um, usually the way it's organized is the person who wants to uh, leave or, or dissolve the co-ownership uh, d delivers a notice that says, I want to dissolve the ownership or dissolve, dissolve the business entity. And here's the purchase price. I will pay this price to buy you out, or I will accept this price for you to buy me out. And then the other owner or owners get to decide whether they're going to use that as a purchase price or a sales price. The benefit of that kind of agreement is it gives both sides some control over what happens. The first party gets to decide the price. They got pretty good incentives to select a fair price because if the price is too low, they're going to get bought out for a cheap price. If the price is too high, they're going to have to overpay to buy out the other owners. And the other side gets to decide whether it's a buy or sell provision. So there's, each side has some control. And my experience has been these, these buy-sell agreements can often be completed within a very short meeting of an hour or two between the owners involved in the business. 
Uh, business owners also need to decide what's going to happen if one of them dies or files bankruptcy or goes through a divorce. What happens in those situations is a court or a bankruptcy trustee or an executor may become the uh, uh, representative of that owner in the operation of the business. And that may not be what the owners intended. Easy way to address it is to, to come up with an agreement on how to select or set the value of the business and for the other owners to buy out the owner who has passed away or filed bankruptcy or is going through a divorce. Uh, and that provision can include payment provisions where it's paid out over time. But if the, the value is a fair value, the courts will often accept that cash is an easier thing to divide than the business entity. Um, but it's it's you want to think about it in advance and agree in advance on how we're going to handle that so that if, if and when it happens, uh, you don't have to deal with a, a co-owner who's an executor or, or even worse, an ex-spouse of one of the owners. Uh, method of accounting. Uh, generally, there's two basic ways to keep books. It's either a cash method or an accrual method. CPAs will usually tell you that the best practice, the most accurate way to keep your records is to use an accrual method. But in a small business, it's usually much easier to use the cash method of accounting. It makes sense for the owners to talk about how they're planning to keep those records and make sure they're in agreement and how those records will be kept, those accounting records will be kept. They should also discuss where the books and records will be kept. Uh, ordinarily, the books and records should be kept in the office and they should be kept in a location where all the owners will have access to them and will be able to inspect or examine them when they choose to. Uh, the owners also ought to decide what's going to happen if somebody chooses to withdraw or retire. It's not a buy-sell situation where they're either buying or selling, they're just flat leaving. Um, and, and the other situation is expulsion. What happens if we're going to fire one of the co-owners? How do we handle buying out their interest, coming up with what's the value of their interest, and then buying their interest out? Typically in these situations for death, bankruptcy, divorce, and withdrawal, retirement, or, or expulsion, an easy way to handle that is to select a, an appraiser uh, for the, the owners to mutually select the uh, appraiser or to select the appraiser in advance. And, and go by that appraiser's decision about what the value of the business is. And again, it's also helpful to have some kind of payment terms. So instead of having to come up with a lump sum to buy out the partner at one particular time, it may be spread out over a period of two or three years, and it may be interest-free or it may include some interest. But those agreements can be reached in advance. And, and the idea of these are, are the situation I typically see is that when owners start a business together, they like each other, they get along with each other. But when problems occur, uh, all of a sudden things go south. And it's almost impossible to reach agreements once things go south and once the owners get mad at each other. It's much easier to reach agreements on what are we going to do if things go wrong. It's much easier to reach those agreements when everybody still likes each other and trust each other, uh, but it's important to have those agreements in place and to have them reduced to writing.